The Homeward Bound Prophecy Conference is almost sold out, but you can still be a part of this exciting event through our streaming option. Simply go to prophecywatchers.com, scroll down, and click on the bright blue streaming banner to register. 25 of the top prophecy teachers will be delivering 64 messages that you can enjoy in the comfort of your own home. As an added bonus, we are including 80 additional past conference messages for your enjoyment. That's 144 messages that are sure to enlighten your walk with Jesus. We're also going to throw in a one-year subscription to our digital magazine for everyone who registers. 144 messages in our digital magazine delivered to your inbox for a year for only $85. Go to prophecywatchers.com and register today. You are in for a treat. I had the privilege of seeing him at the conference in Branson just a month ago, and the passion that he brings to his presentation is a bit surprising for a man of his age. <laughs> I mean that in a good way, because the passion that he brings about his devotion to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when he starts talking about that and watching him convicted is truly a blessing. He's a researcher, he's an explorer, he's a filmmaker. He travels the earth in search of the evidence that puts to the lie the official histories that we've been taught. He is the director for Gen 6 Productions, Please welcome Timothy Alberino. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Could I get a water up here? Somebody that's in charge of the water? Um, how many of you were at the Branson Conference? Okay, good. Not too many of you. For those of you who were, you've seen this movie before. For those of you who weren't, this will be an extended version of an Elbrino analysis, if you know what that is. Um, I want to thank uh, Gary and Bob for inviting me first off. They're great guys. I love those guys. I love everything they do. I follow Prophecy Watchers, like all of you, and uh, I, just, uh, I just love those guys a lot. And, and so thank you, Gary and Bob, for inviting me here. Um, Okay, without any further ado, in order to decode the sequence of enigmatic events that are set to unfold in the prophetic future, it is incumbent upon us to comprehend the magnitude and consequence of what occurred in the primordial past. The procession of history, like the orbit of the earth, is going full circle back to the beginning where it all began. Hence, we can know the end from the beginning. The final chapter of the story is foreshadowed in the first. Genesis is the cipher of Revelation. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing, <clears throat> is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. Do we have my slide on the screen? Any attempt to crack the cryptogram of eschatology without employing the cipher of Genesis is an exercise in futility. Scripture foretells of a final world empire that will arise in the earth at the end of the age. Symbolized in the motif of the fiery phoenix reborn from the ashes of its incinerated corpse, this last empire will be resurrected from the antediluvian diluvian ashes of the first empire, the empire of the gods. The angelic insurrection and subsequent genetic miscegenation that occurred in the earth preceding the flood of Noah will be repeated at the end of the age before the world is destroyed again, but this time by fire. The acolytes of the mystery schools and high-level Luciferians worldwide, both in the so-called right-hand path of the mysteries, exemplified by Helena Blavatsky and her theosophists, 
and those of the more sinister left-hand path, exemplified by Elister Crowley and his Thelemites, are all laboring. Thank you. Are all laboring toward the same ultimate objective: to usher in a new golden age and resurrect the Atlantean Empire that sank beneath the waves of the Great Flood. My objective this evening is to elucidate a largely unheralded apocalyptic scenario that is burgeoning on the horizon like a hurricane. This inevitable future contingency will affect every single one of us in profound ways and indeed already has as it concerns the increasingly tenuous predicament of our human condition. If we are to truly appreciate the severity of this impending storm for mankind, we need to look back to the progenitors of our race at the dawn of history. So let's begin by dispensing with the ludicrous propaganda that we have all been subjected to regarding our antediluvian antecedents. From the dawn of history, a better way of life has been man's dream, man's goal. A better way of life with freedom from the work, the worry, the hazards, the tensions and insecurities of everyday existence. Contrary to popular conception, our prehistoric forebears were not Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble. We have been intentionally disinformed concerning the nature of the prehistoric world and the caliber of men that inhabited it. Western society is incessantly propagandized with the idea that in the infancy of our species, men were savage imbeciles without knowledge, without technology, and without civilization. Even most Christians, while rejecting the evolutionary model of Darwinism, nevertheless assume an evolutionary paradigm of history. It's merely taken for granted that we are the apex of our species, that our antecedents were in vastly inferior to us in every way, that as you move backwards on the timeline of history, you descend from the intellectual superiority of modern men living in the 21st century to the barbarous stupidity of antediluvians living in the prehistoric past. However, this gradual retrograde of civilization that can be traced in the historical record comes to a grinding halt, circa 3300 BC. This is that seminal period of time in which historians mark the beginning of civilization attributed to the Sumerians. But in reality, what the date 3300 BC designates is not the beginning, but the abrupt end of an advanced global empire that was liquidated from the face of the earth. The Western ideology concerning the upward progression of civilization in which mankind has been gradually rediscovering the rudiments of science and technology over the centuries does not correspond to the reckoning of ancient cultures, many of whom have managed to preserve, at least in part, a testimony of the technological wonders of the old world, the hybrid races that inhabited it, and the cataclysm that brought it to ruin. In a sense, modern man is suffering from a delusion of grandeur in which he believes himself to be the discoverer of science and the inventor of technology. And yet, the truth is that many of the scientific advances of the 20th and 21st centuries are not new discoveries but rather rediscoveries of the ancient knowledge that was lost in the flood. Whether we like to admit it or not, the Western mind, both secular and Christian, has been greatly influenced by a Darwinian paradigm of history, which has effectively disarmed us in the face of a crisis the likes of which humanity has never before seen. Ironically, this impending peril for mankind is predicated on the very antithesis of Darwin's theory. Charles Darwin managed to distill from nature the polar reverse of nature's condition. The Darwinist doctrine pertaining to the evolution of the human species assumes genetic 
ascendancy. According to the evolutionary model, the Homo sapien began his biological ascent as a primordial hominid, and over millions of years gradually mutated into a more sophisticated creature until the blind volition of natural selection conceived you and me. This miraculous ascent from the knuckle-dragging ape to the moonwalking Homo sapien implies a tremendous increase of genetic information and complexity. The problem for evolutionary apologists, and frankly for all of us, is that our species has not been undergoing a process of genetic ascendancy, but rather of genetic entropy, which is to say genetic degeneration. The fact is the human race has been devolving for thousands of years, and the shocking headline is that the process of degeneration is greatly accelerated in modern man. In order to acquire a more accurate prognosis of our degenerative condition, we need to compare ourselves to the original prototype of our species. Mankind was not designed to be a little higher than the animals, but a little lower than the angels. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. We were designed to be much more magnificent than what we have become. Our progenitor, Adam, was the prototypical man, the perfect human being. There was not a single aberration in his genetic code. And because his genetic architecture was impeccable, he very likely possessed astonishing capabilities, mental and otherwise, that would be considered superhuman today. He was certainly physically much more robust than we are, mentally more acute, and spiritually more attuned. And then came the fall. In the book of Romans, Paul writes that sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and that the wages of sin are death. Paul was not merely waxing poetically. He was describing the physics of the law of sin and death. When Adam sinned, the mechanism of death was activated and the gears of entropy were set into motion. Mankind and the natural world of his dominion began to devolve. Consequently, as the blueprint of Adam's genome is copied from one generation to the next, it gradually loses information and accumulates deleterious, bad mutations. It degenerates. Modern man is now divorced from Adam, our original genetic blueprint, by hundreds of generations. And the corrosive gears of entropy, the law of sin and death, is manifesting in catastrophic ways. The human species is presently suffering from a crushing load of genetic mutations precipitating a host of physical, psychological, and spiritual maladies. Quite contrary to what we've been led to believe in textbooks and in movies, in comparison to prehistoric man, modern man is pathetically inferior. Friends, I'm sorry to say, we are all really crappy versions of human beings. <laughs> in the 1950s, geneticists were growing increasingly concerned about genetic degeneration in the human populace of their day, which they estimated to be occurring at a rate of roughly 0.1 to 0.3 nucleotide mutations per person per generation. Essentially, a genetic mutation is equivalent to a spelling error in a book, in this case, the codex of our DNA. One of the most renowned of these geneticists, a man by the name of Herman Muller, projected that just one, just one deleterious mutation per person, per generation, would lead to an inevitable long-term genetic deterioration of the human race, ultimately resulting in what is called error catastrophe, which is a fancy term for extinction by genetic mutation. We now know that there are over 1,000 deleterious nucleotide mutations per person, per generation. And that is, by many accounts, a conservative estimate. We also know that human fitness, the overall vitality and reproductive quality of our species, 
is presently declining at a, at a rate of approximately 3 to 5 percent per generation. What we are witnessing is the beginning stages of a species-wide genetic mutational meltdown that will lead to an inevitable crisis of apocalyptic proportions. This is not my opinion. This is the quiet consensus of many respected population, genetic, uh, population geneticists worldwide. And unfortunately, the evidence is all too conclusive. As many of us can attest to personally, the cancer epidemic is ravaging the human race. Cancer is fundamentally the result of genetic mutation. There are many factors that can provoke or accelerate genetic mutation, such as exposure to certain chemicals, radiation, dietary imbalances, etc. But these are all ancillary to the underlying problem, which is genetic degeneration. The human genome is decaying. The American Cancer Society has projected that by the end of this year, approximately 1,700,000 new cases of cancer will have been diagnosed in the United States alone. 600,000 people will have died this year alone. One out of every two males and one out of every three females will develop cancer in their lifetime. These shocking statistics testify to the crisis of our devolving condition. Dr. John Sanford, a celebrated geneticist from Cornell University, elucidates the inevitable reality facing mankind. The extinction of the human genome appears to be just as certain and deterministic as the extinction of stars, the death of organisms, and the heat death of the universe. The cancer epidemic is just one of many indications that our genetic clock is expiring. There are a host of other warning signs manifesting in the aggregate of the human species. But like cancer, we have simply assimilated them into our lives, as if their occurrence were perfectly normal. Instead of evacuating the building when the fire alarm goes off, we've just got used to the noise and carry on as if the building were not burning to the ground. The reason why we are so content to absorb these terrible afflictions into our subconscious without being utterly dismayed by their dire implications is because the crutch of technology has given us a false sense of confidence. We have a facade of fitness sustained by technological props, which have only been available to society within the last century. Before the pivotal, pivotal advances in medical science during the 20th century, we had no way of buttressing our genetic weakness. And as a result, simple maladies were wiping out mass populations all over the world. The average life expectancy in the 19th century was 40 years old. Of course, the infant mortality rate was off the charts back then, and poor hygiene practices were contributing to the widespread proliferation of pathogens. But again, the underlying problem was and is genetic degeneration. It's a simple equation. The more we degenerate, the easier it is to kill us. If we were, if we were as genetically robust as our antediluvian antecedents, our bodies would easily overcome many of the diseases that now require the assistance of pharmaceuticals to subdue. So in summation, there are two essential points that I want you to distill from all of this as we move forward. First, that antediluvian man was superior to us in every way. And second, that modern man is, is facing a crisis of mutational meltdown that will ultimately render the human genome inviolable. We've been discussing the human component in the equation of the pre-flood age and its pro prophetic implications, but I want to turn our attention onto what we might call the angelic component. Throughout the Bible, we are presented with a fascinating interplay between men and angels. But what exactly are angels? The word angel, malak in the Hebrew and angelos in the Greek, 
simply means messenger, an envoy, one who is sent. There's likely a multifarious array of different species among the hosts of heaven, but the angels that interact with human beings on the earth always have the appearance of men, at least in the scriptures. So much do they apparently resemble us, or rather, we resemble them, that the writer of Hebrews, while encouraging the church not to forget to entertain strangers, includes the curious addendum, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Quite contrary to Renaissance imagery, there are no female angels recorded in the scriptures. In fact, a feminine form of the Greek word ankylos does not even exist. Except in the case of seraphim and cherubim, which are esoteric creatures subject to interpretation, angels are never depicted in the Bible with wings. We do, however, often find them in possession of technology such as vehicles of conveyance and weapons of war, which infers scientific knowledge. They have a spoken and written language. In fact, they keep records. They have a sophisticated governmental hierarchy, including a military. They sing and compose music, which infers creativity and an artistic aptitude. It is also apparent that angels can eat and drink. They do so on several occasions in the scriptures. Incidentally, we also see Jesus eating fish and bread after the resurrection. I don't believe that the angels and the resurrected Christ were eating and drinking for our amusement. It seems evident that the consumption of food is not unique to the earth. After all, the Israelites ate the bread of heaven in the wilderness. It was called manna. We know that some angels deliver messages, some engage in warfare, some execute the judgment of God, and some minister to men, but we are never explicitly told who or what exactly they are. The question seems seems to be left for us to extrapolate. So let's extrapolate. Angels have scientific knowledge. They utilize technology. They have a spoken and written language. They keep records, they have a governmental hierarchy, they compose music, and they indulge in food and drink. These are the hallmarks of society and culture. What we are dealing with is a highly advanced civilization that predates our own. Mankind is not the inventor, but the inheritor of civilization, the beneficiary of an extraterrestrial society, culture, and science. And of course, by extraterrestrial, I mean not of the earth, non-telluric. The truth is that human beings are not all that different from their angelic counterparts. That is, if by human beings, we mean Adam, our original genetic blueprint. The problem for us is that we have lost the ability to perceive the hyperdimensions in which they traffic. The scriptures insinuate that the world perceivable to fallen man is only the shadow of reality. A shadow casts a two-dimensional silhouette of a three-dimensional object. Essentially, it's a darkened and flattened reflection of a luminous, multi-dimensional reality. In other words, we see the world in shadows. I believe that Adam could perceive the dimensional totality of creation until his mind was darkened because of sin. The good news is that those who are redeemed in the cross can look forward to regaining in Christ what was lost in Adam. For now we see in a mirror dimly a dark reflection, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. And of course, Paul is alluding here to the resurrection And as it relates to the resurrection, there is a term that unifies angels and men in extraordinary ways. Benai ha Elohim, the sons of God. This term is always and only used in the Old Testament to denote the non-procreated children of God. Simply put, beings that were not conceived in a womb, such as angels and Adam. It is a designation of paternity, origin, and estate. During God's dialogue with Job, He asked Job rhetorically, 
If he was there when the foundations of the earth were laid, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, these sons of God were witnesses to the creation of planet earth and may pre-exist mankind by eons of time. The term carries over into the New Testament where it maintains its Old Testament meaning but is now applicable to the sons of men who through Christ can become the sons of God. But as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now this particular verse has been mangled and twisted to undergird all kinds of strange theology. But the meaning is explicit if we allow the term sons of God to maintain its original context. Those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of, of man, are the sons of God. I suspect that every one of us in this auditorium was conceived in a womb as the result of the fleshly will of our human parents. John is not saying that those who believe in Jesus are already the sons of God, but rather are given power to become the sons of God. This power is the hope of the gospel. It's the resurrection. Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage with those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore. For they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Those, who, those of us who believe in Jesus are on a trajectory to become the sons of God equal to the angels in respect to their immortal condition and hyper-dimensional nature, which is essentially a reset of mankind to his original blueprint. So, when we think about angels, let's liberate our minds from the vapid imaginations imposed on them by Catholicism, and instead think in terms of an exceedingly advanced and unfathomably ancient extraterrestrial civilization, of which our terrestrial civilizations are but dark reflections, especially as we consider the insurrection of fallen angels in the pre-flood world. The Genesis 6 affair introduces us to a specific delegation among the hosts of heaven. In the Masoretic text, the translation of the Old Testament that most of you are familiar with, these beings are referred to by the nature of their estate, the sons of God. Likewise, the Septuagint, the Greek translation familiar to the early church, calls them the angels of God which consequently invalidates the ridiculous Sethite nonsense, for those of you who are familiar with the Sons of Seth theory. However, Hebrew tradition, as well as numerous extra-biblical sources, designate these beings with the Aramaic word irene, rendered in the Greek as egregori, and in the English as watchers. The word watcher denotes occupation rather than classification or kind. But there is some dispute as to what exactly the occupation of the watchers was. Some argue that these entities are called watchers because they were appointed to watch over the affairs of men. Others contend that the watchers are synonymous with the seraphim who guard or watch over the throne of God. What is incontestable is that whatever the occupation of these beings, they became enamored with the daughters of men and committed one of the most grievous sins recorded in the scriptures, evidenced by the severity and swiftness of their judgment. They procreated an unsanctioned race of hybrid entities in the earth. When taken together, the primary biblical and extra-biblical accounts, sources pertaining to the Watchers, the book of Genesis, the Book of Enoch, the Book of Giants, and the Book of Jubilees 
relate the following story. And, and of course, this is a very abridged version of events, and many of you are familiar with these events, but we're going to review them quickly. The story begins with a company of 200 watchers who are enamored with the daughters of men. Their forbidden desires are betrayed in a line of dialogue recorded in the book of Enoch. Come, let us choose wives from among the children of men and beget us children. Now, I'm going to suggest to you this evening that the insurrection of the watchers was catalyzed by one primary vice, envy. The watchers were envious of men. Specifically, there are three things they coveted. First, females. Men were given a special gift that was never granted to the sons of God, a female counterpart, a wife. The watchers lusted after human women and envied men for their wives. Second, offspring. Because men had female counterparts, they could procreate. Procreation is a privilege not afforded the children of heaven. This is why abortion is such an abomination and promoted so vigorously by the enemies of mankind. They envy our ability to reproduce offspring. Third, dominion. Men were given dominion of planet Earth. This is perhaps the most important and most overlooked aspect of the fall of the Watchers, especially as it relates to the end of the age. The Watchers coveted man's dominion of the Earth. So, burning with envy and lust, the Watchers bind themselves with an oath of mutual, mutual implications and willfully rebel against God. They abandon their heavenly abode and descend to the earth on the summit of Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. Understand that the descent of the Watchers does not merely imply a change of locality from heaven to earth, but a change of nature. They abandoned their heavenly abode bodies. This becomes clear when the appropriate hermeneutics are applied to a critical passage pertaining the watchers in the book of Jude, pertaining to the watchers. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. The word abode in this verse is okaterion in the Greek which is most commonly used to, de to describe a bodily residence. Jude's choice of the word okaterion to designate that which the watchers left in their heavenly domain cannot be coincidental, as it only appears in one other passage of the New Testament. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. The word habitation here is okaterion. Paul is using the same word to describe the bodies the saints will gain at the advent of the resurrection that Jude uses to describe what the watchers left or forfeited when they descended to the earth. The watchers willingly chose to shed their transcendent bodies in heaven in order to assume on earth the material bodies that would facilitate what they intended to do. The watchers take for themselves wives from, from among the daughters of men, and they copulate with them. The women give birth to a hybrid race of giants. Now we tend to imagine that the giants born of the watchers were all of the same kind because the Bible is vague when referring to them. But according to some apocryphal manuscripts, there are at least three different races of giants in the pre-flood world. The Greek translation of the Book of Enoch records, and they, the women, bore to them, the watchers, three races. First, the great giants. The giants brought forth, other translations read, slew the Nephilim, and the Nephilim brought forth, or slew the Elio. And they existed increasing in power according to their greatness. The Book of Jubilees concurs. And they begat sons, the Naphidim, and they were all unalike, and they devoured one another. And the giants slew the Naphil, and the Naphil slew the Elio, and the Elio mankind, and one man another. So according to Hebrew tradition, there were divergent races, or successive races of giants in the earth before the flood that differed in both appearance and prowess from one another. 
It will become apparent as we progress that the watchers and their offspring had plenty of time to breed before their empire was annihilated. And the breeding was not limited to human females. After producing offspring with their wives, the watchers select 200 specimens from every animal species for miscegenation, which is to say genetic engineering. The animals give birth to sentient monsters. The Book of Giants, discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls, expounds on Enoch's narrative concerning the activity of the Watchers and their hybrid offspring. Although the manuscript is damaged and highly fragmented, the pieces that are left to us paint a lurid picture. 200 donkeys, 200 asses, 200 rams of the flock, 200 goats, 200 beasts of the field from every animal, from every bird, were selected for miscegenation. They defiled, they begot giants and monsters. They begot, and behold, all the earth was corrupted. Not only were the watchers procreating with the daughters of Adam, spawning races of giants, they were also inseminating animals, spawning all kinds of hybrid monstrosities, like mad scientists drunk with the with the power of procreation. The watchers were using their own DNA to genetically modify the creatures of Earth into perverted images of their own likeness. Until after generations of breeding and crossbreeding, the genomes of all flesh were corrupted. The Earth was a genetic mess filled with hybrid mutants. And, as, that, and as, as if that were not enough to kindle the ire of the Maker, the Watchers teach their wives, their offspring, and mankind the forbidden secrets of heaven. Now, the Watchers did not teach impractical New Age mysticism. They disclosed the secrets of what we call today science and technology, relating to the fields of astronomy, pharmacy, geology, metallurgy, masonry, mathematics, genetics, and physics, among others. But don't make the mistake of associating their technology with ours. This is not what the technologies of the Watchers look like. Most of our technologies are superfluous, designed for the convenience and amusement of impotent human minds. The high technology of a vastly superior angelic civilization would not resemble the tools and toys that we have contrived for profit and play. So don't go looking for laptops and Lamborghinis in the antediluvian age. The technology of the Watchers is so foreign to the mind of man that we would scarcely be able to recognize it even if the waters of the flood had not washed it away. So complete was the destruction of the old world that the only evidence left standing to testify of its technological superiority are the megalithic edifices that were constructed with solid stone. Like the bleached bones of a corpse long dead, the ruinous remains of megaliths worldwide stand in memoriam of the Watchers, their fallen empire, and the judgment of God. Encoded within the megaliths is knowledge lost to mankind. The quarrying, transporting, shaping, lifting, and placing of these mammoth blocks of hard stone flawlessly fitted together without the use of mortar and precisely aligned with specific constellations and cosmological phenomena implies a level of technological capability that would not be seen in the earth again until the advent of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. Without considering any other evidence the megaliths alone prove the existence of advanced scientific knowledge in the prehistoric past. Mankind is corrupted with the knowledge of the Watchers and excels in war, idolatry, murder, sorcery, and licentiousness. The Watchers divide the dominion of the earth amongst themselves and appoint their hybrid sons as rulers over their respective realms. 
Now, this is, the, this is the Atlantean paradigm, what I call the empire of the gods. The objective of the watchers wasn't just to corrupt the earth, but to rule the earth from behind the thrones of their hybrid sons, who were part human. Remember, dominion of planet Earth was given to Adam and his offspring. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. The incursion of the watchers and their procreation of hybrid offspring with the daughters of Adam was nothing less than a full-scale usurpation of mankind and his divine mandate of dominion. The watchers intended to install their own sons on the throne of human dominion and, make the, and to make themselves the gods of a new creation, a creation that would worship them rather than the king of heaven. The giants and their monstrous cousins oppress and, and enslave mankind. Men are forced to feed the giants, and when they can no longer sustain them, the giants devour men. And as they perish, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. This was a holocaust of the human race. The genetic line of Adam was being devoured and mutated out of existence. God hears the cry of mankind and intervenes. A severe judgment is decreed from heaven against the watchers and their offspring. Now the watchers are sentenced to be bound in Tartarus, Hades, until the day of judgment at the end of the age. When warning the church of false prophets, Peter reminds them of the fate of the fallen watchers. God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to Hades and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. The watchers, through the mediation of Enoch, petitioned God for clemency for both themselves and their sons. God rejects their plea and sends Enoch to deliver the bad news. Now, Enoch finds the watchers assembled together in a place called Abyss Jail, weeping because of the severity of their judgment. Now, we are specifically told that Abyss Jail is located between Lebanon and Senir. Lebanon likely refers to Mount Lebanon, and Sinir is another name for Mount Hermon. It just so happens that one of the most imposing and important megalithic structures on earth is located between these two mountains, Baalbek. Baalbek is home to the greatest pagan temple ever constructed and the largest megalithic stones ever d discovered. The foundation stones of Baalbek weigh more than 1,000 tons each. Although the Romans built a temple to Jupiter on top of its megalithic foundations, there can be no doubt that Baalbek was constructed in the pre-flood age. Not even the archaeologists will dispute that. I believe it was a temple built by the giants in dedication to their angelic fathers. It very likely served as the epicenter of the Watcher's empire on earth. It makes sense then that they would be gathered together at Baalbek awaiting Enoch with the verdict from heaven. After rejecting the petition of the Watchers, God dispatches angels to bind them hand and foot. But before they are cast into Hades, they are forced to witness the destruction of their beloved sons. The angels incite the giants to war with one another until they utterly annihilate themselves. Now, don't imagine giants beating each, other, beating each other over the head with wooden clubs. This was a hybrid world war, kingdom, of, kingdom against kingdom, race against race, bringing to battle the advanced weaponry of an angelic civilization. It's, this was a futuristic war. This was, not a, this was not giant cavemen beating each other with sticks and stones. 
And of course, the story ends with a cataclysmic flood that lays waste to the empire of the gods, cleansing the earth of their abominable offspring and their mutant genes. Now, much of what I just summarized was probably already known to many of you, but what most people don't realize is just how much time elapsed from the descent of the Watchers to the cataclysm of the flood. In Genesis 5, we are provided with a genealogy of the antediluvian patriarchs, beginning with Adam and ending with the sons of Noah. According to the Septuagint, from Adam to the flood, which occurred in the year Methuselah died, some 2,256 years transpired. Most of your Bibles are derivations of the Masoretic text, for reasons we don't have time to explore this evening. The Masoretes subtracted 100 years from the birth date of each firstborn son in the genealogy, significantly shortening the pre-flood timeline. Many scholars regard the Septuagint to be the correct reckoning of the Genesis 5 genealogy, and I certainly concur, but again, for reasons we do not have time to unpack. The Book of Enoch tells us that the Watchers descended in the days of Jared. In fact, the name Jared means descent in Hebrew. From the birth of Jared to the flood of Noah, some 1,296 years transpired. Folks, that's well over a thousand years for the genetic miscreants of the watchers to propagate all over the earth. A thousand years of watchers begetting giants, and giants begetting more giants, and watchers begetting monsters, and monsters begetting more monsters. It's also a thousand years for the proliferation of the secret scientific knowledge that the watchers disclosed. Great cities were constructed, kingdoms were forged, and a unified hybrid empire expanded over the whole earth. This was the true golden age of yore. The gods were dwelling among men, mingling their DNA with the genomes of terrestrial life, teaching forbidden knowledge, and hijacking for themselves the veneration that belonged to the King of Heaven. Megalithic temples were raised to their dedication across the empire, constructed with advanced technology by the hands of their hybrid offspring. These temples did not memorialize distant mythological deities from ages past, past but the living gods who walked am among men, visiting the temples in the flesh to receive the adoration and human sacrifice offered by their mutant creations. Other megalithic edifices were devised, some for technological purposes, some for astronomical calculations, and some, perhaps, as fortifications against the wrath of heaven that was sure to befall. Now, I am persuaded that the megaliths worldwide were erected during the golden age of the gods, approximately five to 7,000 years ago. You can see that indicated on the timeline. Many of the ancient cultures, such as the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans, attributed the megaliths to the gods. And you find this all over the earth. They are also attributed to the offspring of the gods, the demigods. Again, this can be traced in, in all of the major uh, the, the major mythos of the different cultures, of the ancient cultures across the earth. In fact, the word that we use to this day to describe the advanced masonry employed in the construction of megaliths is associated with the Cyclopes, who were the children of the gods in Greek and Roman lore. Cyclopean masonry is the trademark of megaliths worldwide. One thing we can say about the megaliths with certainty is that their building employed the hermetic principle as above, so below. There is a clear association between the megaliths and the cosmos, particularly with the planet Mars. I believe that the fallen angels were attempting to recreate on Earth the pre-Adamic empire that once existed on Mars and elsewhere in the cosmos. The megaliths themselves, many, um, 
at least many of them, may have been built on top of far more ancient foundations belonging to a pre-Adamic age. But this is strictly a matter of speculation. There's no way that we could ever prove that. The general theme of Genesis 6, the gods that mingled with men, their demigod god offspring, and the cataclysm that destroyed their world, has been preserved in one form or another by every primary ancient culture on earth. However, in stark contrast to the Hebrew narrative, the watchers are often portrayed as Promethean archetypes, benevolent beings that descended from heaven to civilize mankind and to usher in a golden age of prosperity, of peace and knowledge in which men and gods dwelt together in harmony. And that is the narrative, of course, of the occult. This is certainly the doctrine of the mystery schools, which are the occult priesthoods, going all the way back to Sumer and ancient Egypt, committed to the preservation of arcane knowledge, i.e., the knowledge of the watchers. Within the mystery schools, the golden age is often typified by the mythical lands and cities of Lemuria, Thule, Mul, Hyperborea, Shambhala, and Atlantis, among others. The legend of Atlantis is particularly significant. Not only does it serve as an allegory of the Golden Age, it also happens to precisely correlate with biblical prophecy concerning the end of the age. According to Plato and Manly P. Hall, the story of Atlantis begins with the gods dividing dominion of the earth amongst themselves. Each of the gods is apportioned a realm in which a temple is erected to his veneration and sacrifices are instituted for his appeasement. Poseidon receives for his lot the island of Atlantis. He becomes enamored with the human woman and takes her to wife. The woman gives birth to five pairs of hybrid sons, ten in all, who become the kings of Poseidon's Atlantean empire. The dominion of the empire is divided between the ten hybrid kings who are bound together in a league and rule over seven islands. Ten kings bound together, together in a league, ruling over seven domains, is prophesied in the book of Revelation concerning the end of the age. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. The ten horns of the dragon are ten kings, and the seven heads crowned with seven diadems are the seven domains over which they rule, which I believe to signify world dominion, seven being the number of completeness in the Scriptures. This red dragon, identified in Revelation 20 as the devil, gives his authority to a beast that rises up out of the sea. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. The beast is symbolic of an earthly kingdom with ten kings that directly reflect the dragon and his kingdom. The ten kings of the earthly kingdom are imbued with the authority of the ten kings of the dragon's kingdom. Notice that this beast rises up out of the sea. Atlantis, symbolic of the watcher's kingdom, sink into the depths of the sea. It is my opinion, and please take this with a grain of salt, that the beast rising up out of the sea is a prophetic allusion to the re-emergence of the empire of the gods that was inundated in the waters of the Great Flood over 5,000 years ago. Furthermore, I suspect that like the ten sons of Poseidon, the ten kings of the earthly kingdom receive their power and authority from their fathers, who are fallen angels and rulers in Satan's kingdom. In other words, it's Genesis 6, 2.0. This suspicion of mine appears to be validated in the second chapter of Daniel, where King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of a great statue, the head of which was made of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the midsection of bronze, and the legs of iron. And the feet were made of iron mixed with clay. 
The statue's compartmentalized sections, cast in distinctive meadows, represent five empires that would arise before the end of the age. Now, Daniel informs Nebuchadnezzar that the first empire identified in the statue, the head of gold, was his own dominion, the kingdom of Babylon, and that the other four would precede him. With history in hindsight, we can verify the astounding accuracy of Daniel's prophecy regarding Nebuchadnezzar's statue. The chest and arms of silver were the successive kingdoms of the Medes and Persians. The midsection of bronze was the empire of the Greeks. The legs of iron were representative of the Roman Empire, which, just as the statue depicted, would ultimately be divided into two kingdoms, the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire. The final empire represented in the statue is depicted in the feet with ten toes, which are cast in iron mixed with miry clay. This is the empire of the dragon and the beast from Revelation. As is the case in most biblical prophecies, there are multiple dimensions of interpretation built into the symbology. The metaphor of iron mixed with clay in the feet and toes of Nebuchadnezzar's statue is twofold. First, it represents a fractured kingdom. And whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. But the metaphor of iron mixed with clay does not stop there. It continues. And whereas you saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Whoever they are, it's apparent that they are not men, but are mingling their seed with the seed of men. Now we know that this passage is referring to the beast's ten kings because the following verse informs us. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. These are no ordinary kings. These are hybrid kings, the sons of the gods. And their leader, who is separate from the ten, embodied in the beast itself, the man we call the Antichrist, is very likely the hybrid son of the dragon. Look at the first thing the dragon does when he appears in John's revelation. Behold the great fiery red dragon, having, se having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. This is the devil's last move. The final execution of a strategy that began with the watchers in the days of Jared. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of, of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Notice that after the dragon and his angels are cast to the earth, the saints overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and by virtue of the fact that they do not love their lives to the death. Now I'm going to suggest something here that may seem overly speculative, but you'll see where I'm going in a minute. I have a feeling that not loving their lives to the death carries a dual meaning. First, 
that they do not deny Christ in the face of severe persecution and death, certainly, without question. But second, that they do not love their lives to the degree that, there are, that they are willing to receive the biotechnological upgrades that would extend and preserve them. You see, I believe that not just the ten kings, but the subjects of their kingdoms are going to be hybridized. I began this presentation by highlighting the impending crisis of genetic degeneration and mutational meltdown that is looming on the horizon for the human species. It is no coincidence that a host of technological breakthroughs relating to genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology have arrived just in time to offer mankind the tools to forestall his inevitable fate. But not only has the technology miraculously arrived in the hour of our crisis, the theology is also in place. It is a theology of transhumanism. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ without the cross. The rectification of the human condition without the resurrection. It is Luciferianism, the promise of apotheosis, whispered once again from the tree of knowledge, you shall be like the gods. At first, biotechnological upgrades will offer us the possibility of healthier, longer lives without altering our humanity. But as we progress further into the future, the crisis of genetic degeneration will force mankind to make a choice. Do we accept the atrophy of Adam and go quietly into the night as men? Or do we shed Adam and live forever as gods? You see, the only way that humanity can truly avert the mortal decay inherent in the human condition is to become something other than human. I believe that the transhumanist doctrine and the technologies that facilitate it are designed to acclimate the human race in anticipation of the event that will catalyze the full-scale hybridization of mankind, the return of the gods, and the resurgence of the Golden Age. They will appear in the hour of our need as the saviors of our race and will offer mankind the apple of apotheosis to become like them. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men and by doing so will rescue humanity from the apocalypse of mutational meltdown. I believe that there's already a hybridized race prepared for the advent of their arrival, a first fruits, if you will, of their counterfeit rapture and resurrection, a new breed of men sent down from heaven, led by the hybrid son of Satan himself, Apollo, the son of perdition. Now the last age by Kume Sibyl sung has come and gone, and the majestic roll of circling centuries begins anew. Justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Only do thou at the boy's birth in whom the iron shall cease, the golden age arise. Befriend him, chaste Lucina, tis thine own Apollo reigns. He shall receive the life of gods and see heroes with gods commingling and himself be seen of them and with his father's worth reign over a world at peace. Assume thy greatness, for the time draws nigh, dear child of the gods, great progeny of Job. See how it totters, the world's orbed might, earth and wide ocean and the vault profound, all see enraptured of the coming time. Now these stanzas were, were penned around 40 B.C. by the Roman poet Virgil, more than a century before the book of Revelation was written by John. They recite an ancient pagan prophecy uttered by the Cumaean Sibyl, the oracle of Apollo. It is from this poem that the phrase novus ordo seclorum, 
new world order is derived. Like the second chapter of Daniel and the book, like the second chapter of Daniel and the book of Revelation, the prophecy, the prophecy of the Kumean Sibyl foretells the reemergence of the golden age in which the gods and men commingle and Apollo, the hybrid, the hybrid son of Satan, rules over the earth. And Satan is equivalent to Jove, Jupiter, in the Roman pantheon. In Matthew 24 and Mark 13, Jesus is discussing the end of the age with his disciples. He tells them, For there will be great tribulation such as, ha such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The phrase, no flesh would be saved, can also be rendered, no flesh would be able to be saved. There is only one qualifier for salvation in the cross of Jesus Christ. One, you must be human. Jesus did not die for angels and he did not die for hybrids. He became a man to redeem men. No flesh would be saved is reminiscent of the pre-flood age in which all flesh was corrupted. It's not accidental that a few verses later, Jesus invokes the pre-flood age. But as the days of Noah were, were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. The days are shortened for the sake of the elect, not to save their lives, but to preserve their humanity. One of the reasons why genetic modification is so dangerous is because the modified genes can be made to be inheritable by successive generations. I believe that the reason why the days are shortened at the end of the age is because if they were not, there would be no candidates left for salvation on the earth. No flesh would be able to be saved. All flesh would be corrupted. But thank God he shortens the day to preserve the elect. And we're wrapping up here. The resurrection of the Golden Age and the enthronement of Apollo as its king is the great plan of the, of, the, of the Masonic order and of all ancient mystery schools. Albert Pike, who was a sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite and one of the most influential Masons in American history, stated that the imagined mythical beings in the pantheons of the ancient Persians, Indians, Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans were but political illusions to satisfy the vulgar. Because man still looked back with longing to the lost golden age when his ancestors communed face to face with the gods and hoped that by propitiating heaven, he might accelerate the renewal of it. Like Albert Pike, Manly P. Hall, one of Masonry's most celebrated philosophers, also believed that the great work of Freemasonry was to restore the golden age and build a new Atlantis that was to be ruled by a philosopher king who was descended of a divine race, that is, he belonged to the order of the Illumined. During the 19th and 20th centuries, as occultism was surging across the world, many of the most prominent Luciferians were heralding the dawning of a new golden age. The New Age movement was predicated on this very expectation. Ellis Bailey was one of the most prominent American theosophists of the 20th century and the founder of the Lucius Trust, an occult organization that publicizes the Luciferian doctrine. Bailey was an acolyte of H.P. Blavatsky and, like Blavatsky, worked for the Brotherhood of Masters, who she referred to as the Hierarchy. The Hierarchy are ascended beings residing on the earth, or rather, under the earth, who have been tasked with guiding humanity towards the realization of the Great Plan. While channeling one of these beings, Bailey wrote concerning the advent of Christ's reappearance, which we would call the coming of the Antichrist, it will then be possible for the hierarchy, the Church of Christ hitherto invisible, to externalize itself and to function openly upon the physical plane. This will indicate a return to the situation which existed in Atlantean days when, to use Bible symbology, God himself walked among men and the members of the spiritual hierarchy were openly guiding and directing the affairs of humanity as man's innate freedom permitted. Now, in the immediate future, this will happen again. 
The masters will walk openly among men. The Christ will reappear in physical presence. Another thing that will happen will be that the ancient mysteries will be restored and the ancient landmarks will again be recognized. Those landmarks which, which masonry has so earnestly preserved and which have, which have hitherto securely embalmed in the Masonic rituals, waiting the day of restoration and resurrection. The day of restoration and resurrection. It's the Bible upside down. The inversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the Luciferian, the day of restoration and resurrection is the return of the golden age when the philosopher king, the, sons of, the son of Lucifer, is enthroned and men become like the fallen gods. But for the believer in Jesus, the day of restoration and resurrection is when the dead in Christ are raised to become like Him. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the rectification of the human condition. It is the restoration of the human race. What was lost in Adam is regained in the Son of Man, the second Adam, who conquered sin and death on the cross and rose from the grave to give us life. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as, for as by a man, Adam, came death, by a man, Jesus, has come also the res re resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The resurrection is the only hope for mankind. All other promises of restoration and immortality are antichrist. We only got about two more minutes left here. There will arise in the last days a transcendent race of beings who, like the watchers of old, will appear as the Promethean benefactors of mankind. They will preach a gospel of salvation without the cross. The restoration of the human race without the resurrection. They will usher in a new golden age and reinstate the empire of the gods, a new Atlantis. In one last insurrection, the hybrid kings of the earth and their fallen angel fathers will lead mankind against the Lord and against his anointed. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Nebuchadnezzar's dream foretells the fate of the beast's hybrid empire. A stone was cut out a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image of, on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This mountain is the kingdom of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus is the second Adam and the rightful ruler of Adam's domain who redeems and restores Adam's offspring to the Father. Satan will attempt to install his own son, the man of sin, on the throne that belongs to the Son of Man. But he will fail because there is only one who is worthy to take the deed of dominion that was given to Adam in the beginning and rule over the earth. And I saw on the right hand of, of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. 
So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the dead, and in, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of, out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who, who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.